Hi, and welcome to the BPD Bravery Show, where we discuss tips, strategies, struggles, triumphs, and success stories related to borderline personality disorder. Here is your host, Faye Green. nice to meet you, Faye. Likewise, I mean, you've got so many awards. I was just reading about it. And I'm like, geez, <laughs> that is that is impressive. Oh, thank you very much. No, I, 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 I like what I like what I do, you know, so that helps. How did you get into it? I mean, like uh, you know, a little bit by accident. I was interested in mentalization. That's what I was interested in. Um, mm -hmm. I was in understanding mentalization I did my PhD on theory of mind which is a neighboring concept of mentalization and um, so I was originally interested in conduct disorder in children so children that are sort of dysregulated but for all kinds of reasons and um, uh, did my PhD in conduct disorder and then uh, when I moved to Houston I met Peter Fonagy who um, was running this big project on borderline personality disorder. And um, I started working with him on that. I was always interested in BPD because it was always very interest, uh, interesting disorder for me. I don't know if you know Lorna ben Benjamin's work. I when in grad school. I learned about Lorna Benjamin's work. So I was always interested in it. But it's a very good um, condition to study mentalization in because uh, mentalization is... Um, affected in very particular ways in BPD and so for me it was a, a, a sort of a marriage of two things that I that I was very very interested in and that's how I and then the other big thing that happened was people were not uh, looking at this in young people and we were had access to all these young people in the Menninger Clinic who meet, met criteria for BPD and so we were able to to um, enroll them in our studies and really learn from them, understand how personality disorder work at, at the early stages of the disorder. And, and so that helped me publish a lot on, on, on developmental aspects, you know, so that's, that's the long and the short of it. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I know that until recently, uh, you know, diagnosing younger, like kids or teenagers with BPD is, was frowned upon. And Recently, I've been hearing that more and more doctors are hopping onto this wagon of diagnosing people earlier. Yeah. Um, so you got lucky that you found a place that, yeah. and talking about mentalization, am I saying it right? Mentalization? Mentalization or mentalizing, yeah. You, you can do the noun or the verb. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the same, huh? I, um, I've watched your the way you describe it several times with the crayons. Yes. Is it crayons and candles? Yes. And it's so interesting because I'm like, yes. are you looking into my brain or what? <laughs> <laughs> it feels like that. It feels like that when you're doing uh, these tasks, you know. <laughs> but the, the, those were some of the early mentalization tasks that developed in the 90s that they actually originally did with autistic individuals. Because people with autism have this sort of mind blindness um, they can't read minds. And now people with personality disorder can read minds, but they often do so in a biased way. You know, they kind of overthink what other people are thinking. They hypermentalize is what we call it. Oh, yeah. hypermentalize. Hypermentalize. For someone like me who doesn't know much about mentalization, how would you describe it? A yeah. Very, very, um, no fancy word kind of form. <laughs> What well, is what it is, it is reflecting or thinking about your own mind or the mind of other people. That's what it is. So thinking, stopping to think about your mind, what's going on in your mind or the minds of other people. So, you know, let's take a situation. You're, your friend doesn't turn up for dinner. You had a date to have dinner and your friend doesn't turn up for dinner. That moment where you stop and you think, well, why didn't she come to dinner? Is it because of the fallout that we had? Is it because of traffic? Is it because she's angry at me or she actually was trying to get at me? Or, you know, what's going on? Did something happen with her? 
and how do I feel about the fact that she didn't turn up? You know, am I very upset about this? Can I move on about this? What am I going to do about it? Am I going to text her? Am I just going to let go? That process of reflecting on her mind and your own mind in relation to each other, that's mentalization. It's, mm. it's a reflective capacity. And so how does that tie into BPD? BPD. Well, it turns out that people with BPD and people with personality disorder, and perhaps we'll get to talk about why do I want to talk about personality disorder and not BPD, <laughs> but we can talk about that later. But how it ties in with people with personality disorder, that it turns out that people with personality disorder struggle to mentalize. They struggle to that process of stopping and reflecting is harder for people with BPD. So what happens with people with BPD is they tend to um, jump in there, into the situation, have difficulty pausing or putting on the brakes to think, you know, what was going on here? And then they tend to make assumptions about what the other person might be thinking or what the intention behind other people's actions are and go over into action of fixing it, you know? So let's imagine you look like you're recognizing something. <laughs> you know, you, you oh, have this example that you, you want to share? <laughs> oh, this pattern of behavior is like, because for me, I do tend to, now I don't, you know, say a friend doesn't show up. I'm not going to start thinking they're, they ditched me. I don't take it. My first reaction is not to take it personal and could be possibly is because I, my best friend has major depressive disorder and it took me a while. I, for me to re figure out how to deal with the fact that when we made plans, the last minute, she just couldn't, she, there was she always had a good excuse, but I knew it's her depression and me being me. And I think it might have to do with BPD changing of plans and things not working out the way originally planned. It just, it makes me go not like I, I couldn't handle it. Yeah. I literally like it would. And I, again, I wouldn't be upset at her. Yes. I would just be upset at myself and not for, 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 for feeling like I'm like, I don't know what to do with myself now. Yeah. And so I started doing, um, whenever I, knowing her yes. and other friends that were always there, right? Like if we made plans. I know I could count on them, but with her, I always had to make a plan B. Yes. 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 And, but now say if she didn't show up because she's depressed and I know that, you know, now my, it's like, how could I fix this situation? Not like, how can I get her here? But how can I now I have to help her? I have to get her out of this depression, yeah. which I couldn't, I, I even reached out to her mother and she's like, there's nothing you could, you know, as you know, you, you, I, I have to make this right. Like yes. I have to fix this. Yes. I have to make her yes. not be depressed, which quite frankly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's not possible. Right. We can't, we don't have that level of control over others. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Or say I knew someone's going through a hard time and that was, Still, I'm still not sure what's wrong with me. I can't figure out what's the underlying. I think it's the fear of abandonment. So someone, a different friend was going through a hard time and I decided, and I hardly had food for like money for food. Like I had like, I had this amount of money for food this for this week. And instead I was like, oh, you know, he's going through a hard time and that's why he's not talking to me. So I have to make it better. And I sent him, I took all the money I had for, my food and I bought sent him flowers. What the heck is wrong with with you? Like, why did you you have no money for why are you sending him what she didn't even appreciate? Yes, 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 yes. Like yeah, so so you 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 think it's fear of abandonment and, and I and I, I you, you may be right. I mean you're the expert on <laughs> what it feels like, right? You're the expert on what it feels like. But I but I do think, you know, Related to the mentalization issue for people with BPD or, or personality disorder, research shows that um, people with and clinical experience that that you know there is a it's it's 
it's difficult for people with BPD to know where they end and other people begin. And what you just described to me reminds me of that, you know, it's like, where do I end and someone else begins? And so your needs for friendship and intimacy with your friend, you know, um, gets muddled with his need for food and, you know, or your friend's depression, you know, and then it, it sort of gets muddled where you end and where they begin. And so this this self-other negotiation is very difficult for people with, with BPD, you know. It's a very difficult negotiation of, of, of this, this boundary and where to stop in terms of what my needs are and what another person's needs are. The, the, the two get confused. And, and mentalization's got something to do with that because when you mentalize, you are in essence able to say, well, this is what's going on in my mind. That's what's going on in their mind. Um, you know, and those two are related to each other, but they're not the same. And I'm not confused about that. And and now I need to sort of slow down and I need to think, how can I meet my needs? And what, what are my needs? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what are my needs right now? How can I meet those needs? And how does it relate to my friend's needs? And, and, and meeting those needs and, and what's possible in meeting my needs and what's not possible. So, so you, I think you're touching on the core of, of the, 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 the challenge of, of BPD. Um, you know, earlier I said, I, I now, or a lot of people in the field try, try to move away from BPD as a diagnosis actually, and talk about personality disorder more broadly. Um, and, and it's because what all personality disorders share is this, problem in negotiating self and other you know and we constantly have to do that everything that happens to us you know I'm a mom in parenting I have to constantly negotiate where I end as a mom and my child begins as a as a child you know where, where my child is as another begins with my in my marriage I have to constantly negotiate you know where I end and where my husband begins so I think it's part and parcel of life this negotiation of self and other but in BPD or in personality disorder, it's a, it's a major challenge. I think it's the core of the disorder. And why do you say that you're moving away from this BPD? Is it overlapping? I because I'll be honest with you, I could pick out a thing from this personality and from that from that disorder. Maybe I don't have all to qualify for, but I could pick out things that is that it. Because in exactly. the DSM, it's still separate, right? It's exactly it. You put your finger exactly on it. So in DSM, we still have, there's, there's two sections in DSM that are of relevance, section two and section three. Section two is the main, the main you know, body of the, the DSM. And in section two, you still have the 10 disorders. So you will have, you know, BPD, antisocial, histrionic and narcissistic in that sort of cluster B that they used to call cluster B and then cluster A you'd have schizotypal and schizoid and paranoid and then cluster C you'd have obsessive compulsive personality disorder and avoidant and dependent but as you rightly point out if you have features of one personality disorder you probably have some features of other personality disorders and for BPD, it often hangs together with some, some a little bit of paranoia, a little bit of avoiding people sometimes, but then other times being too close to other people. Um, sometimes impulsivity that you see in, in, in antisocial, sometimes uh, a, a self-focus that you see in narcissism. So it all sort of blends into one. And when people have tried to look to find those 10 disorders in, in the data, they don't find them. They don't crystallize like that actually in any personality disorder data. And so that had that made um, experts uh, believe, and they suggested this 10 years ago to the American Psychiatric Association, the DSM work group, uh, suggested, listen, let's just for, let's let go of the 10 disorders and we create one dimension that explains what is common among all of the personality disorders. And this dimension that they came up with is called level of personality functioning. And it is this self-other negotiation. Mat or, and the way that the DSM talks about it, maladaptive self and interpersonal functioning. So it's this um, problems in hanging on to yourself, 
when you are in the context of interpersonal relationships or mo most importantly, attachment relationships. You know, so uh, I don't know if that rings true for you, Faye, you know, what you think about that. Well, what I think about it is I'm afraid of it because is it like IQ, like scores? It's very interesting. You you very uh, uh, you your your mind keeps going where the field is at. It is a bit like you know IQ is this one dimension, and we think it's a quotient, right? We we think about intelligence as lying on this one dimension, and then you can have people at 140, which is very high, and you can have people at 60, which is on the low end. But everybody can be organized on this sort of dimension and, and the idea is that there is a personality quotient and you know the reason it makes kind of sense to at least to me is that I have days when I have when I've got good personality days and bad personality days so it gives us a, a dimension where you can move up and down that dimension within yourself like good personality days bad personality days and it can also help us um, not put people in a category of personality disordered versus people who are not personality disordered because we all are in a continuum of having a bit more or less than it. The other advantage is that we can think then about components as personality function that may be strengths and weaknesses. So for instance, um, if you have an IQ of 100, you may um, be very good at math but not so good at verbal ability. So your average average is out at 100, but your, your verbal ability may be 95 and your math may be 110. In the same way, we can start thinking about personality. Overall, you're someone that has, that has little prop, few problems in negotiating self and other. That puts you on the low end of the personality quotient, right? because you don't really struggle with that. You may be struggling with anxiety or depression, or you may be struggling with substance use, but you don't struggle with self-other negotiations. But in that broader domain, you may have particular strengths. You may be very, very good at, at, at empathy. You may be really strong and empathic towards other people, but you may be very poor at self-direction. You know, you may be someone who who don't, you get lost in your goals quite easily. So it gives us a framework for understanding the sort of common feature of personality, but also the flavor of how you may manifest your person. Some people are more impulsive than others. Some people are more emotional than others. Some people are more introverted than others. Some people are more extroverted than others. So we, we can all sort of vary on this common dimension of self-other relatedness, but then we can each have our own unique flavor of how this manifests in, in relationships. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I'm just afraid of having like a number. Yeah. Because I'll have a very low one. I don't like this. <laughs> Let's not do the number. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you the number scheme that's currently on the books. <laughs> they, 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 the current, the current scoring runs from zero to four. So zero, one, zero, one, two, three, four. And if you zero, actually, you're just typical. You know, most of the time, you don't get into um, relationship difficulties easily. You're, you've got a strong sense of self. You don't get confused about, you know, you where you end and other people begin. That's a sort of zero. When you get to a one, you sometimes have difficulties in, in self-functioning and interpersonal functioning. But by and large, you're, you're most of the days, you don't have trouble in that. When you get to number two, there are more days than other days when you struggle holding on to yourself, when you struggle making sense of other people. And then when you get to three, you have more often trouble. So this will be um, when it really starts interfering perhaps at work or in your personal life and you, you, you need help with figuring it out. A four is often folks who get so distressed by this self-other uh, interference that they may hurt themselves or that they may, you know, feel like life is not worth living anymore or they, it's, it's more severe. So that's the, the scale at the moment. It runs from zero to four. 
Um, but the neat thing for me is that we it acknowledges that we can move in and out of that continuum. You know, you can be a you can have days where you are really feel messed up and you're a three or a four, but then you can have other days where you're functioning on a zero or a one. And we can draw on those days that you are zero or one to to learn from it. And, you know, every morning you can get up and say, you know, I'm going to have, um, today I'm going to try and have a one day. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be at three or four today. I feel that's less stigmatizing and gives you more, empower you more to, to not be stuck in a category of personality disorder, right? Because the categories made us, it was zero or one. You either have it or you don't. And it feels to me like you're stuck in this category. And then you have to, move to a zero, but that's very far to go. You know, I, I like the idea that we can move from four or three just to two or have days when we have zero or one and, and other days that we have. I like that flexibility. So I like the dimension and the freedom that it gives us in, a, in our personality functioning, including me. You know, I, I think everybody lies on that continuum. So it, 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 it evens the playing field for me. Where is this number thing? Is it in the DSM or? It's in the DSM. So if you, but in section three. So what happened was when the work group suggested this dimensional model, the American Psychiatric Association said that the field is not ready for it and we need to retain the 10 categories. And so that's what happened in section two, the main body of the DSM. Section two has the 10 disorders, but in section three, you will find what's now called the alternative model for personality disorder, AMPD, the alternative model. And this is the one that most researchers ascribe to because you find the alternative model fit the data better. It's very hard to make the 10 categories fit the data, but the, the alternative model fits the data more. So the researchers like the alternative model and a lot of clinicians do too. Some clinicians are still not used to it, and they, they need to make that transition to think in dimensional terms and think about it in, in this sort of dimensional way. But I hope that we can move towards that because it just makes more sense to me. It's closer to the data. I think patients may like it. I don't know what you think as a person with lived experience and, uh, you know, what, what do you, whether you feel or do you feel there's comfort in the borderline diagnosis that you feel that that makes you feel more uh, settled in, in knowing that there's a category that you belong to? What I think, and I might be very wrong, is that when it comes to getting help, yeah. um, it's a lot, I feel like people just look at, okay, you have BPD, so you need this and this treatment versus what are your symptoms, right? Because you could have, we all have different, we have different symptoms. And if I have a little bit of the paranoia and a little bit of the, well, yeah, a little bit of the paranoia, um, <laughs> um, you know, and so, and I'm just treated for BPD. What if I, you know, I feel like there's too much focusing on what your label is versus what are your symptoms and how do, how can we get you yeah. better, right? Yeah. Treating the symptoms versus treating the quote unquote disorder. disorder. The category, the category. Yeah. That's with, my, my thinking. I'm with you because I, and I think this is what this dimensional model gives you because you can say you're on a zero to a four in terms of maladaptive self and interpersonal function. I don't even want to say maladaptive self, just in terms of self and interpersonal function, because we all lie on that continuum. So you can be a zero to a four on that. And some days you're higher than other days. Then you can talk about the flavor, the symptoms for me, you know, what, what, what's my flavor in terms of personality? You know, I'm a bit more extroverted than introverted. Um, you know, am I someone that is a bit more neurotic than other people? Probably, you know, I get more nervous quite easily, you know, and I need to calm myself down. What's my flavor? The, my friend may be more introverted and someone who's more withdrawn, maybe as neurotic as I am, but a little bit more withdrawn. So each one of us have a different flavor. That What you talk about symptoms, it, it's the word we use in, in the field is heterogeneity. People are not the same. It's heterogeneous. People are heterogeneous. There's heterogeneity in the symptoms. <laughs> 
that's the word for exactly what you talk about is heterogeneity. All people with BPD are not the same. They, everybody's different because of the flavor. Now, what they share is this problem in negotiating self and other. All people with BPD, I would venture to say, everybody share that piece. You know, that there's a problem in, in negotiating self and other. Um, but, but how it's going to manifest, some people's going to manifest it by uh, more approach behaviors. Some people are going to manifest it by more withdrawal. And, and you, you know, I don't know how, how many people with BPD you know, but there are people with BPD who end up just avoiding relationships. You, well, there you go. That's me. So, yeah, tell me about it, Faye. Tell me about it. I'm, I, it's just at the point, it's like, I got so hurt because, yeah. you know, you get so attached and you're so right. I don't know where they end. I feel like I'm like, you know, say two people, right? Two separate people. And, you know, this is me. This is you. And for me, you're 100% right. This is me. But I totally bleed into them. Like, I'm totally... You're you're 100 right. I don't know. I I take on their mu taste of music, their hobby. Like there's no there's no separation. And so then being too attached to them, and them freaking out, and then they leave. Right, and then the cycle continues, and the leaving is so freaking painful. Painful. For me. Yeah. So painful. Usually, I mean, it's always followed by suicidal ideations and thoughts. Sometimes I've ended up in the hospital because of that too. And so uh, every time this happens, I, I isolate for longer periods of time, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is very unhealthy. Yes. But then I think being in that pain and that emotional pain and in that intense, yeah. I can't, I don't want to go through that. So right. Right. I've got the best idea on how to handle it. I just, <laughs> isolate, and it's terrible for my health, but it's, yeah. Well, I know. I, I think I think what you describe is very typical. The older people get, the more they start avoiding. In the in the beginning, they they give it a chance. They open themselves up again. They trust that it's going to work out. And then you know, over time, over time, as they get older, they just like you know, I'm not even going to try. Now, I, I would say you have to try, right? Because like any human being, you you have a need for connection and, and intimacy. And, uh, you know, I always think I work a lot with teenagers um, and I'm the mom of a teenager myself. And we all have a need to be seen and understood and heard. We, we have a need, I see this most, most often in teenagers, to have some kind of mirror in our lives, you know. And that's what intimacy gives you. It gives you a relationship, a real good healthy relationship gives you a sense that you're not alone that you're being understood that there's some somewhat a mirror that that's held up and and you it's a safe place now so you you deserve that too Faye so <laughs> I don't want you to give up qu quite quite yet but I do think for people with personality disorder and the easiest way in, in mentalization based therapy that I can talk about it is to say you have to slow down in really checking, constantly reflecting, reflecting, reflecting. I don't know if you've seen um, Karate Kid. Um, I like to use Karate Kid as a metaphor for mentalization because you'll remember, at least in the first Karate Kid, which is showing my age, but there's, of course, a second Karate Kid as well. But in the first Karate Kid, the, uh, the, the teacher makes the young boy, he wants to desperately learn to fight because he's being bullied, and he goes and, and, and the, his teacher doesn't teach him any of the moves. But what his teacher teaches him is wax on, wax off, wax on, wax off. I think in the second version, it's jacket on, jacket off, jacket on, jacket off. So what his teacher is teaching him is this movement, wax on, wax off. And then, you know, weeks later, finally, his teacher makes a move on him and he does the wax on and the wax off. And so what, what, what I think mentalization is the same thing. We have to practice, 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 slowing down, practice, 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 um, reflecting. Um, you know, when, 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 when you are you know, going into a new relationship, slowing down and thinking, okay, hang on, 
am I, is this what's going on in my mind or is this what's going on in, in, in his or her mind? You know, am I, am I, is this about my needs or is this really about his needs or her needs? Um, and constantly slow down and working extra hard in, in parsing out my mind from the mind of the other person. That's what happens in MBT. Basically, the therapist is constantly uh, marking and, and pointing out what is the therapist's mind and what is the client's mind so that, so that this waxing on, waxing off, waxing on, waxing off gets practice again and again and again. Um, we can talk about why it is that people with personality disorder don't learn this uh, skill early on, you know, there's, there's some theory about why, why people with personality disorder didn't learn to separate their own mind from the mind of other people more easily. Uh, you know, and we, we think it comes from early childhood that, that people with BPD, and I'd be interested to hear your story, Faye, but um, uh, people with BPD often didn't grow up in a uh, uh, environment, a laboratory. I always talk about the laboratory. You need a sort of lab, a laboratory where you practice the waxing on and waxing off. And so if you grow up perhaps with a parent who is confused about um, her or his own mind with a child's mind, then uh, then this merging of self and other occurs very early on. And there's this, the, 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 a child may not learn to separate from their, their, their mom's mind or their dad's mind. So this practice in, in, in figuring out this is me and this is my mom, this is my needs, this is my mom's needs, or this is my needs, this is my dad needs. This is separate from, you know, we're separate people, equal but separate. This is one of the theories of how this comes about, this sort of mentalization capacity that does, doesn't quite um, come online in a way that, that it does for, for other people. So I, I don't, don't know you, I'm, I can see you're busy thinking as I'm talking uh, uh, whether this rings true or not. Yeah, because I'm trying to figure out, well, I grew up in a cult. And um, okay. so everyone is the same. Everyone thinks the same. Everyone dresses the same, right? So I don't know if it was me. It was the me and my parents versus it, that's, it's not, it wasn't just my mom, yes. but it was everyone. So yes. it wasn't really my mother thinking that I'm part of her. I mean, of course, she still does think that I got to be like her, but it's, everyone in the community it's mm -hmm. she thought that because everyone thought that yeah. and yeah. so but then why didn't everyone <laughs> develop bpd mm -hmm. yeah. you you're so you're so smart the reason <laughs> is because that environment interacts with your temperament so your temperament's the part of your personality that you're born with and so you were born with a particular um, way of reacting to the world. The best I always think about, we can think about two dimensions really to understand this, approach and avoidance. Some people are born with more approach behaviors and some people are born with more um, avoidant behaviors. So what is the typical temperament of someone who ends up developing BPD? It is someone who is more reactive. So it is someone who tends to be more emotional, who feels things more deeply, who is more sensitive. I think it's a good thing to be sensitive, right? Because if you're not sensitive, oh, now I know, not. you know, it's painful. But, <laughs> but imagine, imagine you, uh, you have a sensitive temperament and you're placed in an early childhood environment where someone helps you know what's your mind. So it sounds like from what, what happened with you, you were in an environment where you would have had sensitive temperament, but you were not, no, nobody helped you know what your mind was. And nobody helped you know how you were separate from the, the greater whole, because in, in a cult, everybody's, everybody should have the same mind by the, by um, the sound of it. Well, yeah. I, I'll be honest with you. I was always a little bit different, but it was frowned upon so it was yes. I, they were always trying to make me like the okay. fit in when i didn't fit in okay. and it's not that i didn't want to fit in it's not that i was trying to be a rebellious it's just i was different 
Yes. And they're, even from a very young age, I, I mean, I was just not, yes. I remember everyone was playing like with the girl toys, all the girls, because it was separate girls and boys were never playing together and they were all with the dolls and, and I was, it was just not me. I wanted to play like the boy, I wanted to run and I wanted to, we, we would like, I wanted to climb fences and I wanted to play with cars just because I thought that was more exciting. And I, I, I was called wild, the wild boy, the boy, the wild girl. It was just, and it wasn't because I wanted to be a boy or anything. I was just different. It's, I couldn't help it. And in the beginning, I, when I was called that, you know, I was four or five and I was called that I was, I took it as a compliment. Cause I was like, of course, my life is so much more fun. You're playing with dolls. I'm climbing stuff. This, of course, you know, I, and then I think at the age of five, I started realizing that there are, people are not <laughs> telling me that as a compliment. Yes. <laughs> they're saying that as there's something like you're different, you're wrong. It's like, something wrong. And, and, you, see, <laughs> and if you, if you have, if you have a sensitive temperament and you pop a big part of you want to please, and you're constantly being told you're wrong. That's Mar that's what Marsha Linehan meant with an invalidating environment. You know, you you take someone who's sensitive and actually want to please and want to fit in, but just is different. And this person, for good or bad, keeps getting feedback that they're wrong or defective, or that's that isn't that feels like an invalidating in environment, and it begins to tear yourself apart it begins to uh, make it very hard for you to to feel like you have a coherent sense of self you you continue to be confused about me not me me not me me not me you know and uh, and then this the you know there's another uh, person Dan McAdams, he talks about the binding of personality. And I really love that term because it means the coming together of personality. You know, as you get older, this is the work of childhood and adolescence, and especially adolescence. The, the personality needs to bind. Your identity begins to come together. But if you can constantly get experience, feedback, you know, that there's something wrong, that binding doesn't happen. And things don't come together for you as a coherent whole. Now, when things don't come together for you in a coherent whole and yourself doesn't, your personality doesn't bind, it's very diffi difficult to be in a relationship with another person because yourself is not solid. And now you're, uh, you know, you have to hold on to this self in negotiating your needs in relation to someone else's needs. And that gets very tricky. If uh, if you're if you don't have a, a coherent sense of self, but it's difficult to develop that coherent sense of self if there's a bad fit with your environment, and it sounds like you you were a bit of a fish out of water in your in your um, early environment. So you know it 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 it's possible that that's one one narrative for for what what happened with you, Faye. Yeah, from from a mentalization based perspective, that's how we would. Um, uh, make sense of, of what happened to you from, from that theoretical vantage point. Is there a way to avoid? I mean, I know that, so there's part of the temperament, right? But is there a way to avoid personality disorder? Say the kid is still very young. Yes, yes. Can you so avoid it? You can, I think you can, because I think, but it takes a very special thoughtful early environment because say imagine a child born with a sensitive temperament you know Marshall Lenahan's sensitive temperament and let's say this child is born with the sensitive temperament which in like I say it's it, what's good about a sensitive temperament is that you actually have higher empathy you can you are sensitive to the environment you can have leadership capacity you are someone that can um, that can be contagious, get other people, you know, excited. You've got all of these emotional components that are actually very good for society and good for relationships. But if you're put in an environment where you are not matched well, so in other words, uh, you are told you are wrong, or even worse, you are abused in some way, or you have a parent who struggle with mental health themselves. And for that reason, they can't 
mentalize you and they can't realize that you have a sensitive temperament and they don't realize that they need to slow down. There are a multitude of reasons why, um, uh, you know, why an early caregiving environment can't match a child with sensitive temperament. In your case, it was a cult experience, you know. So there are multiple ways in, the, in which this sensitive temperament cannot be matched. Um, but if it is matched, you can actually become a very, uh, not, not only just a well-functioning person, but a very special person because of your sensitive temperament. You know, I would say perhaps very well-known people that have changed the world would have been people with sensitive temperaments who were matched by a caregiving environment that um, slowed down and helped them make sense of their the way that they were different and help them foster some resilience over time to to be to to have seven layers of skin instead of one layer of skin you know um, use the sensitivity for when it works but not let the sensitivity sabotage you you know so I think there are there are there are actually um, ways to prevent it but it, it depends on some some environmental components that can help a sensitive child make sense of that sensitivity and, and kind of translate the sensitivity into something positive and not something that becomes a, a hurdle in their lives. So how do you know, say a child is problematic and there are so many kids that have trouble with other, you know, different things. How do you know, how do you diagnose it in, yeah. in, in kids? In young, you know, I think this is, uh, we, when, when children are pre-adolescent, you know, all of these things will, will be things that you have to keep an eye on if you're a mom or a dad. A emotion, high emotionality, just being sensitive, um, impulsivity, um, having difficulties, difficulty slowing down, having big reactions to, to things that look small. I remember a mom told me that when a mom uh, of a child with BPD told me, or, or a, a grown-up with BPD, she was grown up by then, told me when she used to ask a child to put her shoes away, her child would have a response to that. You know, from the child's perspective, it felt like her mom was being critical. Of course, from the outside, it's not. But we have to remember what it feels like to be in a sensitive child's skin. It feels like anything that you are being told, like you put your shoes away, can sound like har something harsh when you are sensitive. So it takes a lot of work from a parent to, um, to match that sensitivity. Um, but, but it can be done. And, um, but so, so I, th I say to parents, if they, do find it, if they do find that they have a sensitive child, they're going to have to slow down, and and we don't know if if that child would be, uh, you know, uh, have have problems in, in in personality disorder or some other mental health condition later on, but all of those that that combination of traits of sensitivity, emotionality, impulsivity, I think parents have to slow down a lot with a child like that and check in, you know, uh, you know ask to put shoes away in a way that we can make sure is not feeling harsh or invalidating. And that means that the parent needs to slow down. You can't just take shortcuts as a parent in with a child like that. You kind of have to just give them a lot of space, a lot of time, um, give them a lot of, uh, you know, uh, just space to, to, to air what they are thinking and what they're feeling. Otherwise, you're not going to match that that sensitive temperament and 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 a whole host of poor outcomes can follow some it could be bpd it could be something else as well i always wonder if um this is a very weird thought i always wonder if i could be screwing up my dog because of my bpd because could i be the same mentalization thing could i be doing that to a dog <laughs> it doesn't work that way the, the, the good thing about animals is that they really they he will gladly merge with you Faye. i think you know dogs and cats i think they they gladly become part of us you know i think humans are more complicated you know humans because you you know i think i honestly i don't think you can mess up your dog that's just my <laughs> opinion <laughs> it's something i worry about a lot well, 
You know, the, the fact that you worry about this is really a beautiful thing. You are trying to keep your dog's mind in mind, you know, and, and, and that, that means your dog's going to be okay because, yeah. <laughs> I saw her getting um, up to the hour. It was so good talking to you. I feel like I could talk to you for another hour or two or three. Um, but I have one tip for someone who, like myself, gets close to someone and they start, I don't know how to call it, bleeding into the other person, like yes. not, not knowing where I stop and they begin. Yes. Is there one tip that like I could do to remind myself or snap out of it? Is, is there anything? Or I need to go to intense sex? therapy for that no you know i mean i think they they're you know i'm gonna give you five things five Ooh. like you, you know, if, if 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 i was working with a child I'd, I'd write it on each of the fingers i i these these are this is five things that you can do in relationships that helps you uh, manage yourself in relation to the other person the first thing is focus focus focusing on what's happening. So let's take uh, an example with, um, you know, your friend doesn't turn up. First of all, focus. Okay, my friend didn't turn up. What am I thinking about it? What am I feeling about it? I'm disappointed. It didn't work out the way I planned. That's focusing. Number two, request meaning or give meaning. Request meaning or give meaning. So in this relation, in the example with your friend, it would mean like, okay, I need to put on my detective, you know, if I was working with a kid, I would say we put on a detective hat or we get our glasses, the detective glasses on. We are going to figure out what happened. I'm going to call my friend and say, what's up, friend? I'm here. You're not here. I'm requesting meaning. I'm not making an assumption. I'm getting information. I'm just being a detective. Number three, expanding. So my friend then said, shit, sorry, I'm late. And then I'm saying, oh, well, what, what would you like to do, Sarah? You want to postpone? So we're expanding it. We're, we've requested meaning. We're expanding. So we're now figuring out what's the next step. Number four, we're going to reward. I'm going to say thank you for responding, Sarah. I'm, I was so worried that I got the time wrong. But now I know, you know, you were just late and I need to hang on because remember, we've requested meaning. We've, we've, we, I then reward my friend for, for hanging in there or giving me information. And then finally regulating, which is what are we going to do next time, which may or may not have. Really. So it's five steps in the serve and return between you and other people. Think about relationships as a ping pong game. It's the serve and return between you and another person. If you do those five things, but first of all, you focus, right? And that may be the hardest because that means slowing down. Take a deep breath and say, what's going on? What am I feeling? What is my friend? But if you do those five things in the servant return, I think it's easier to know where you stop and another person begin because you don't, you put in enough steps to not get confused about about the situation. I don't know if it'll work, Faye. You'll have to tell me, you know, again at some stage whether it worked. But um that's that helps me. When I when I feel my thermometer go up, when I feel I'm getting anxious about a situation, I'm taking out my five steps. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm first going to focus, then I'm going to request meaning, then I will expand, then I will reward whoever is with me and I will regulate. And think about next time. So it it works for me, and I I hope that it works. I think it works for people. That's the the components of mentalization. If we draw down what mentalizing actually is, trying to think about what's going on for another person and for myself in a moment in an interaction. That's really the the the, the long and short of it. Thank you. Oh, that's great. <laughs> At least now I know what I can do once this. <laughs> if I if I don't isolate as much. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I want you to get back out there. And remember your wax on and wax off. You do it over and over again, those five steps. You do it over and over again. But but listen, thank you very much. I'm so glad that you are doing this podcast. It's wonderful. I, I think uh, a, a, an expert by experience to, to run a post, pod, pod, podcast like this is what we need. So So thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us on today's BPD Bravery Show. 
If you've enjoyed it, then like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure to tune into our show every Monday and Friday. And remember, you are so much more than your BPD.